I, I don't know if I could share this, but it, it's actually had an effect on my dating life. <laughs> there are people who, who will not go on dates with me because I'm pro-Israel. Uh, I'll tell one quick story if this is if it's not too personal. Uh, I, I went on a date with someone who I'm openly gay, by the for the record, uh, and. Uh, this person said, you know, Richie, I support everything you stand for except one issue. And I said, what's the issue? He said, Israel. And when I said that I was a Zionist, he reacted as if I had uttered the word Nazi. So I proceeded to explain what the word Zionism meant. Um, and then at the end of the date, he asked for my number. So I put in the notes section, Richie Torres, your favorite Zionist. <laughs> You just listened to genocide-supporting congressman Richie Torres explain how his enthusiastic support for Israel's genocide in Gaza is actually making it more difficult for him to get laid. And in a weird way, this actually gives me hope because I think it's important that support for and complicity with mass murder isn't socially acceptable. You should be a pariah if you are explicitly supporting the extermination of an entire population of people. And I guess that he expected people to hear that and feel sympathy for him or something. I really don't know why he shared that. You couldn't waterboard that information out of me. But nobody's going to feel sympathetic, Richie. That's pure schadenfreude. And I'm willing to go out on a limb and say that that guy he was talking about, who we went out on a date with, he never called him back. Who would? You just basically exposed to him that you're a psychopath, and then you leave your number saying your favorite Zionist as if he's going to be like, ooh, okay, well, now I'm convinced. Let me call you back. This dude is a sociopath and so pathetic, but it's actually so much worse for Richie Torres because at the start of that interview, he explains how his support for genocide has personally affected him in other ways. You've been such an amazing vocal supporter of the Jewish community, of Israel, uh, getting a lot of flack for it. What have the last seven, eight months been like for you? you know, there's a sense in which it's been a nightmare. Um, there's no issue on which I face more hate harassment and death threats than on the issue of Israel. Uh, even my mother's been the target of harassment. There were activists who said to my mother, you're a genocide mother and you should have aborted your son. Uh, it's put strain on personal relationships. Uh, I have a sibling who has jumped on the Free Palestine bandwagon. We have not spoken in, in months. Okay, to be fair, the person who told your mother that she should have aborted you, I'm sorry, but that's just objectively hilarious. Now, I've got to say, it is ironic that he's portraying himself as a victim when he is quite literally a victimizer. He used his power, he's been using his power symbolically and materially to support Israel's genocide. Blood is on his hands. He's complicit with the deaths of tens of thousands of people, yet people were mean to him, so he thinks he's the victim. I mean, I can guarantee you, Richie, any Gazan would trade places with you. They'd much prefer mean words over bombs, I promise you. So spare me the bullshit. He also comments on his brother who stopped talking to him because of his support for genocide. And yeah, that makes sense. It makes his brother a normal, compassionate human being. If I knew that one of my family members was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people... I don't think I could talk to them. I would certainly try to convince them to stop, but if they didn't stop and they continued to support the death and destruction of an entire population of people, I, I just could, I couldn't support them. I, I couldn't be around them. I would want them out of my life because that type of person is toxic. That type of person is sick in the head. Now, he goes on to say that he thinks there's been this shift in the Democratic Party with regard to Israel, primarily because of social media, Twitter, TikTok, and whatnot. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. And I say this because it's so much harder to convince people that Israel is defending itself when we all see with our own two eyes videos of dead children on a near daily basis. Information and knowledge is the ultimate radicalizer. The same thing happened during the Vietnam War. Once Americans actually saw the war crimes that our government was committing, they stopped supporting it. This illusion that we're the good guys was shattered when they saw what the U.S. military was doing to Vietnamese people on live television. And the same thing is happening now when it comes to Israel. This is a fascist, genocidal, settler colonial regime, and people with a moral compass, they see that. Now that they're aware, they're opposed to it instinctively because I think that most people 
are good people. So when you try to defend the indefensible, you should expect people to treat you like the monster that you are, Richie Torres, because you are a fucking monster, especially considering new news that we got with regard to this genocide. Common Dreams reports, quote, in a letter published in the medical journal The Lancet on July 5th, three public health experts cited a previous official death toll of 37,396, but pointed out that armed conflicts have indirect health implications beyond the direct harm from violence, making it likely that the the total number of deaths of Palestinians so far is much higher and could ultimately reach close to 200,000 if not more. The authors wrote that an untold number of Palestinians in Gaza have died as a result of destroyed healthcare infrastructure and an inability to get medical care, starvation amid Israel's near total blockade on humanitarian aid, and the loss of funding to the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, one of the very few humanitarian organizations still working in Gaza. The analysis was published days before the Israeli news outlet 972 Magazine published an article drawing from interviews with six Israeli soldiers who described how they routinely executed Palestinian civilians simply because they entered an area that the military defined as a no-go zone and followed a systemic policy of setting Palestinian homes on fire after occupying them. Okay, that's a lot of information to take in. But what this means is that around 8% of the entire population of Gaza, we're talking about 2.3 million people, they've died as a direct or indirect result of this genocide. And the worst part is that it's not even over yet. So the number is going to continue to increase. So we are witnessing one of the most catastrophic humanitarian crises in modern history. And the response from genocide supporting lawmakers like Richie Torres and John Fetterman has been silence in the face of this new news. And it is so outrageous and maddening to hear politicians like Richie Torres whine about not being able to get laid when tens of thousands of children have been butchered by the genocide that he's supporting. And again, even if the genocide stopped now, people would still continue to die due to starvation, due to malnutrition. Families still would not have homes to go back to because so much of Gaza has been destroyed. If you're lucky enough to survive Everything you know might have been taken away from you. Maybe you've lost some family members, multiple family members, your entire family. Everything that has happened in Gaza is going to change every single person's life there forever. And our government has fully supported this. Biden has jeopardized his own re-election chances to continue supporting this genocide. Although now it's kind of hard to say if he even knows what he's supporting given, you know, that debate performance, he's very clearly in serious cognitive decline. So I don't know if he even knows what the fuck he's supporting. But when the Biden administration was asked about the Lancet report with this bombshell number, well, we got feigned concern, but no real commitment to reverse course and change policies. Are you concerned that, you know, the, the figures could be far more staggering than what we've seen uh, published by, let's say, the Ministry of Health in, in Gaza? And, you know, I remember early on, the Assistant Secretary of State, Barbara Lee, uh, told the, I guess one of the committees uh, on Capitol Hill that uh, the death may actually be more than what the, the, the ministry, the, the health ministry, I'm not sure. The, the death toll could very well be more. We know there are potentially people who are under rubble who have not been counted. But it goes to my the point I was making, whatever the number is, the reported number already is far too high. The reported number already is unacceptable. Um, the number of civilian deaths. So, of course, something higher than that would just be further tragedy. But we long ago passed the stage um, uh, uh, where uh, I, I should, th this has been a, a, a horrific human tragedy for You're some time. Go ahead with another question. Yeah. So yeah. I, 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 I absolutely not. I'm not, gonna, I'm not, I'm not even going to entertain that. I'm not, I'm not even going to entertain that. So go ahead with another question. Thank you. It's ridiculous. You couldn't really tell, but I think that a reporter was asking if he was smirking. I have no idea. But regardless, if he was or wasn't, you can't say that the death toll was already too high if you're not willing to make any policy changes, if you're not willing to cut off weapons to Israel. You don't believe that. You're just saying that to placate us, because if you believed that, you would stop giving them weapons. And again, the Lancet report attributes the higher death toll to both direct and indirect deaths. And also there's an IPC report that sounds the alarm on the fact that 96% of Gazans, 96%, they face food insecurity, which isn't surprising, but 
it's another indication that this has to stop right now. But unsurprisingly, the Biden administration, they're still not willing to cut off Netanyahu. The latest IPC report actually says that 96% of the population of Gaza is facing acute food insecurity uh, which is crisis said, level or higher. Dire. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's still very dire. And you've spoken about what the U.S. has done, but the U.S. also continues to be the biggest funder of Israeli military. And under U.S. law, it is required that any country receiving military support must, up, must not obstruct the flow of humanitarian aid during war. And every major rights group, from the United Nations to Human Rights Watch, has said that Israel is using starvation as a tactic of war. Do you disagree with them? So, uh, and are you, just sorry, one yeah. final question. Are you not afraid of completely losing legitimacy so let me let me just answer that. Let me, when it comes let me just to answer. supporting human yeah. rights in one country. Let me just but answer not when it comes to Palestinians. Let me just answer the first question. So I would encourage you to read the report that we issued on this very question two months ago that looked into uh, Israel's compliance with international humanitarian law and their work uh, uh, and whether they had done a good enough job to let humanitarian assistance in. Where we said uh, that there were some roadblocks that needed to be overcome and we had worked to overcome those and we had seen Israel uh, take steps to allow humanitarian assistance in. At times they have been too slow. Uh, at times they haven't moved quickly enough. At times there have been barriers that we need to break down, but we have worked to do it. And we have seen Israel take steps to allow humanitarian uh, assistance in. Now, there is all, as I just said a moment ago, there is always something more that needs to be done. We've talked about the fact that you have a lot of assistance coming to Karim Shalom now, but it can't move around uh, Gaza as freely as it could because of looting by armed gangs. And so we need to come up with practical steps uh, to address that. And I say that to get at the point that I know sometimes everyone likes to make this seem like a black and white issue um, that is completely simple, where there's somebody that's blocking humanitarian assistance, when it actually, it can be much more complex. These people are fucking sociopaths. Even at this late date, they are still lying for Israel. Even after Biden admitted that their bombing has been indiscriminate, they're still not willing to say, we're stopping this, we're cutting off Israel. Listen to John Kirby's reasoning as to why they won't cut off Israel. Israelis have taken some steps to be more precise, more discriminant, and more careful in their operations. Is it enough? No. So we're going to keep at it. We're going to keep working on this. Is it enough? No. The president described Israel as bombing, in, indiscriminate bombing in December. Seven months have passed and you have caused one arm shipment, as I understand. Is that fair? That's right. What's your, is there a question here? Do you think that that's an effective response to indiscriminate bombing of a civilian population? It's never right to be uh, conducting indiscriminate bombing of a civilian population. That's why we continue to work with the Israelis to be more precise, to be more careful. Oh, okay. So you're working with them to be more careful. That's why you won't cut them off. Okay, cool. But you're clearly failing to get them to be more careful, seeing that 8% of the total population has been decimated in less than a year. But, you know, I guess we can all take comfort knowing that they're trying to get them to be more careful. Listen, no amount of money or power could get me to lie like that, especially about something like this. And prior to Biden's debate performance, I assumed that he was committed to Israel's genocide in Gaza for ideological purposes. But now I'm beginning to question if he's just not coherent enough to be an effective leader here to actually tell Netanyahu, you have to stop. Like, I think that clearly Netanyahu, at least to some extent, is capitalizing on Biden's weakness and absent mindedness because no politician would drive their own reelection campaign into the fucking ground to support a genocide, no matter how committed you are to Zionism. So I'm now wondering if he's just asleep at the wheel, because even though Biden has always been a staunch supporter of Israel, they've gone so far that even somebody like him has to have a breaking point where he says enough is enough. But one thing that I do want to point out is the difference in tone between him and his vice president, Kamala Harris. And I say this because in an interview with Joan Walsh, the vice president actually expressed more empathy for Palestinians in just a few minutes than Biden has expressed in the last nine months. She says, listen, I strongly believe that our ability to evaluate a situation is connected to understanding the details of that situation. Not speaking of myself versus the president, not at all. From the beginning, I asked questions. Okay, the trucks are taking flour into Gaza, but here's the thing, Joan, I like to cook. So I said to my team, you can't make shit with flour 
shower if you don't have clean water. So what's going on with that? I ask questions like, what are people actually eating right now? I'm hearing stories about their eating animal feed, grass. So that's how I think about it. Similarly, I was asking early on, what are women in Gaza doing about sanitary hygiene? Do they have pads? And these are the issues that made people feel uncomfortable, especially sanitary pads. Walsh writes, the young people who have mobilized against the destruction of Gaza are unlikely to be mollified by these answers. What does she say to them? She says, they are showing exactly what the human emotion should be as a response to Gaza. There are things some of the protesters are saying that I absolutely reject, so I don't mean to wholesale endorse their points, but we have to navigate it. I understand the emotion behind it. Now, to be clear, she's still clearly trying to walk a fine line, and she's not explicitly saying that she would cut off weapons to Israel, but the juxtaposition between her words and Biden's is stark. From Biden, we get insincere concern at best, but at worst, we get an outright denial of the death toll and him lying about beheaded babies at the behest of Israel. But with Harris, you know, she's not necessarily conceding to protesters, but she's saying the human thing. She's saying their anger is justified because people are dying. That right there is the bare minimum that we should expect from a Democratic administration. And if she were to replace Biden and made it very clear that she's not going to be a pushover like Biden is when it comes to Israel, she could plausibly win back some of the young voters that Biden lost due to this genocide. Not all of them, because she is part of this administration and therefore complicit. But the prospect of a shift would entice a lot of people, especially considering the alternative is Donald Trump, who's saying, saying I want to go further than Joe Biden. He's not supporting Israel enough. So if you give them a vice president in Kamala Harris as the actual option, who says, we're going to change course here, that is something I think a lot of people would consider, a lot of the uncommitted voters. Now, is she using her influence as vice president to pressure Biden? It really doesn't seem like it, although there have been reports that she is trying to distance herself from Biden. I would argue that that's not enough. But one thing I will say after these two weeks is that it's possible in her defense that she has expressed concern to Biden, but she just got iced out by his inner circle because we all know that you know, they've created this impenetrable bubble around Biden and nobody is letting anyone in or out. So he only hears what his yes men and yes women are saying. Uh, but all I'm saying is that Kamala could act as an off ramp for Democrats who are outraged at this genocide. But I don't want to turn this video into another discussion about whether or not Joe Biden should step down because the answer is an obvious yes if you want to beat Donald Trump. But it just kind of seems like, you know, that ship has sailed. But regardless of who the nominee is or not, these are crimes against humanity and they cannot go unpunished. And anyone supporting this genocide should never be able to live it down and should be reminded of this atrocity that they're supporting for the rest of their pathetic lives.